um, version. There are two versions. The version one. I'm going to be working off of version two. Okay. <clears throat> so, and it'll be here on the recording. Let's see. Share, share. Here we go. It's awful cold in here. Yeah, I checked the temperatures like 64 degrees. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Okay, there we go. All right. Yeah, let me move stuff up there, kind of out of the way. And this is version two. Oops. All right. I can't get everything on the screen at once. So let me. Well, it's not behaving. Well, let's do our best. And this is uh, version two. Number one? Yeah. Which of the following molecules contain a central atom with sp2 hybridization? <clears throat> if you remember the, um, uh, the table that I set up was, um, maybe I'll do it again. You have the um, number of groups around the central atom. They can be single, double, triple bonds, or they can be lone pairs. Uh, I think your textbook and many textbooks refer to them as uh, effective pairs. But I call them groups. And you can have, uh, I'm not going to bother with one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then you have the electronic geometry. <clears throat> the electronic geometry um, is based upon these groups. And if you have only two groups around the, the uh, central atom, it's always linear. Um, three groups, well, electronic geometry is, is consistent all the way through. These are trigonal planar with three. Four groups is tetrahedral. Five groups is... Uh, trigonal by pyramid and six is octahedral. Now the question refers to hybridization. So how would you hybridize to get two equivalent uh, atomic orbitals that would allow you to have a linear molecule? The Really, all you have to do is count up how many you need, right? You need to incorporate two atomic orbitals uh, to make an equivalent to hybrid orbitals. So you would start with S and just add a P. That's all you need. SP hybridization will give you linear. If you need three, then you just pick two Ps. If you need tetrahedral, then you need, you need four, one S and three Ps. When you get down to trigonal bipyramid and octahedral, we've used up all our S's and all of our Ps. So now we have to go to D's. D, S, P, three, and D, two, S, P, three. And this is all based on electronic geometry. The molecular geometry then would follow once you've determined this, then you could say something about electronic geometry, and that's consistent um, with the uh, BSEPR model anyway. But that's how you would get at hybridization. Just count the number of groups that you need, and that includes lone pairs, if you have any lone pairs, and um, then start adding them up from S's and then go to P's, 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 and then when you run out of those, you go to T's. 
So to answer the question, SP2 hybridization would be a trigonal plane. And since the Lewis dot structures are given here, um, we look at uh, central atoms. And for A, the central atom, you can have either aluminum or phosphorus for central atoms in that case. Uh, but around each one is four effective pairs or four groups. So they're both tetrahedral, right? That's SP3. So that wouldn't fit. B has three effective groups. So that is SP2. So B is the answer. If you go to C, you've got three bonding pairs and one lone pair. So that's SP3. Uh, same thing for um, uh, D and E is SP hybridization. So it's only got two. Right. Just in case I go in and switch them up and, right, <laughs> and, and change it from, uh, say, SP2 and maybe I say SP, uh, DSP3 or something like that, which none of them I actually would fit that one. But just in case I mix things up. Okay, next one. Let's see. Yeah, I can get all that one on there. That was one. I'm going to leave that up there until I need the space. And three. <clears throat> Consider the molecule and the following hybridization choices. What's the hybridization of the carbon atom that's double bonded to oxygen? So let me draw the molecule. Oops. That was starting to dry up. So this works. So this one has uh, four hyd three hydrogens on it. This one's got the double bonded oxygen. We call that a carbonyl. That one's got a chlorine, and this one's got a triple bonded nitrogen on it. Okay. Um, uh, just if you if you find yourself in organic chemistry, they're probably going to tell you this. But when you start building organic molecules, the rule is that carbon can have four bonds. It can only have an octet; cannot exceed the octet. So here we got four bonds, or here we got four bonds, four bonds. That's typical for carbon. One there, three there. Nitrogen tends to make three bonds. And when it does, as long as it's neutral, it has that one lone pair. Halogens are always like this. They have a, a single bond and then like that. Oh, and then this one has, uh, let's see, uh, two, four, six, and two pair here. There we go. Oxygen tends to have two bonds. Um, so back to the question. What's the hybridization of the carbon atom on the double bonded oxygen? This hybridization, because it has one, two, three groups, is sp2. Okay. Now we can identify the others. This one's sp3. This one's sp3, and this one's sp, because it only has two. <clears throat> okay, so for this one, the answer is B. Uh, okay, four looks for nitrogen. Nitrogen's sp. Right. I didn't have it marked, but since it's already on the board. Uh, okay, now we've got five. One, two, three, four, five carbons. See if I can use some of this that I've already got up here. Needs another carbon. And that's five, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Um, so I've got Double bond here, single bond there, got a hydrogen here, 
Remember the shorthand um, nomenclature and uh, structure of the way we write uh, organic molecules is. If that hydrogen is sitting between two carbons, the hydrogen belongs to the carbon that it's right next to. And the bonds are actually between the carbons. So that's why I write this hydrogen up here. And these other two hydrogens go here. Okay, now we have this carbon with a carbonyl there. We have two hydrogens here. And we have a carbon there and a triple nitrogen there. Okay, just to be complete. Okay, now for the question. What's the hybridization of each carbon atom in the fungal order? So it just, it numbers the carbon atoms when it puts those one, two, three, four, five here. Those are not subscripts. Those are just identifiers for the carbons. So the hybridization here would be sp2. Here would be sp, sp2, one, two, three, one, two, three, sp2. This one's sp3. This one's SP. And it only specified carbons, right? Okay. So with that uh, two, 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 three, and one, it looks like A is the answer. Okay. Next one, six. Our molecule, we specify the hybridization for selenium and selenium hexafluoride. All right, so we need to draw the Lewis dot structure for this in order to find out how many pairs or uh, groups are around selenium. So selenium is uh, a calcogen, it has six electrons. Fluorine has seven each. So that's 42 plus six is 48 electrons. Okay, so selenium's in the middle and we need six fluorines. All right, that's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. We've used up that many. And we can put six more around each fluorine. So six times six is 36. Used them all up. Okay, so now we can say the groups or effective pairs around selenium is one, two, three, four, five, six. So six means D2, S, P, three, three, four, five, six. That's the hybridization on selenium. Okay. Uh, which would be E. All right, let's look at nine. Uh, a pi bond is a result of what? How do we form pi bonds? Remember when you have two atoms, you can only have one sigma bond because the sigmas are always on axis between the atoms. That's all you can have. And you can form these from um, purely atomic orbitals or you can form them from hybridized orbitals. But when you form a pi bond, it's always from the overlap of unused p orbitals. Or I'll say, for example, um, how about trying to pick one that's not too complicated? How about this molecule? Two carbons and four hydrogens. So we would have two carbons, and you start off with a sigma, of course, 
And then you would have our hydrogens. And these can only have sigmas, so we don't have to bother with those. But now we still have, um, let's see, 2 times 4 is 8, or is 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And 12 means that we'd have another pair here that goes into that double bond, which means that's a pi. But how does that pi form? Well, you've got one, two, three groups here, which means it's sp2 hybridized. And that means that there's one um, unused p orbital, say it's pz, unused p orbital each carbon. Those p orbitals sideways overlap, and that's what makes your pi bond. So uh, the one that satisfies those conditions sideways overlap of two parallel p orbitals is D. Stop me if I go too fast. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can get number 10 on there. <clears throat> Use the molecules below to answer the next three questions. Yeah, that's okay. I think I put those together. There's only two questions here, so there must have been three at one time. Okay, so we've got these, these to choose from. It's a ring structure, and by convention, wherever these lines meet is a carbon atom. Okay. Um, so this one's got those three, these two, and that one. Uh, and it gives you the formulas, which really is neither here nor there right now. But for 10, which molecules have P orbitals that share an electron pair to create pi bonding? Oh, so we have uh, room number one, two, and three. Um, right, so which ones do? This one does, right? Each one of these, this is a pi, pi, and pi, so you have overlap there. P orbitals for this one overlap those two. They all three have, right? So D's the answer. All of them have um, P orbitals that share electrons to create pi bonds. Let's see, 11 uses the same model, so we'll move on down to 11. See if we can say something about these again. Which molecules have equivalent carbon-carbon bonds throughout the molecule? Here's where we have to understand the concept of delocalization of uh, electrons in the pi bonding system. When you have pi bonds that are separated by only sigmas like this, they're said to be conjugated. And what that means is that with these pi bonds, they can, they can overlap all of their electron density and delocalize over the entire molecule. So this molecule actually has equivalent carbon-carbon bonds. And, and that's why sometimes you'll see it drawn like this rather than individual bonds to show that it's a, it's a, uh, a perfectly delocalized system. And this produces what's called an aromatic ring. It's very stable. Whereas this, these two do not, right? They've got such a big gap over here. There's no double bond there. So they can delocalize over this system. And that was just stuck there. Right, so it stabilizes here, but it also um, has non-equivalent carbon-carbon bonds. These are definitely, that's definitely a single bond. This might share some overlap. These are single bonds. And what you'll have with single bonds is they're weaker and the carbon atoms are further apart. So that stresses the rings to do that. This way is, is perfect. All of these bonds are equivalent. Um, I don't know, you may not have been here when we were talking about it before, but you can uh, 
resonate that molecule with this one, just shift the double bonds around. And that's the way you show resonance. Oh, but the answer is uh, A, that number one molecule, Roman numeral one is the only one that has equivalent bonds all the way around. And that's been shown. Experimental data shows that those bonds are equivalent. So like I say, nature just does what it does and we have to explain it. And they're equivalent bonds and that's the way we explain it. All right, so let's look at 12. I have to think one of these will work. It's starting to lighten up on me. Okay, uh, the electron configuration of a particular diatomic species is, and it gives it. What's the bond order for this species? Okay, so we have um, sigma 2s, and this is in that shorthand notation. Sigma 2s with two electrons, sigma star 2s with two electrons. And then you go to sigma 2p, sigma 2p with two electrons, and pi 2p, remember pi, pi's in this molecular orbital model can have four electrons maximum. And then we have pi star, uh, 2p, with only two electrons. Uh, two, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, Two, four, six, eight, twelve. Okay, they're all accounted for. Now, how do we calculate the bond order? Remember? Yeah, that was no good. We take the number of bonding electrons: two, four, eight, and we subtract the number of anti-bonding electrons: two, four and divide by two. So that's equal to two. The bond order here is two. And if there are only two atoms in that molecule, that implies that it's a double bond. Although the correlation is not one to one because in molecular orbital bond order, you can get fractionals. Right? And in single, double, triple, triple nomenclature, um, it's all or nothing. Uh, so the answer there is D. Okay, 13. Um, as the bond order of a bond increases, so the bond order, the trend, as the trend increases bond order, what happens to the bond energy? and the bond length, okay? As the bond order increases, the bond strengthens. So the bond energy increases. It takes more energy to break the bond. And the bond length shrinks. It gets closer together, tightens. So the bond length decreases. So increase, decrease would be the answer. And that's C. Okay, 15. Uh, how many unpaired electrons in F2, 2 plus? 15? Yeah, 15. So we're looking at this molecule, actually that ion, and we want to know how many unpaired electrons are in that molecule. And it gives you the uh, orbital sequence from low energy left to high energy right, so that you don't have to think about um, SP mixing or any of that stuff. There wouldn't be any of this one, which is why it's uh, S sigma 2p and yeah, pi 2p 
and pi star 2p and sigma star 2p. I think that's as far as we went. Yeah. Okay. So what you have to do is say how many electrons are in that ion. I always start from the neutral. So if we have two halogens, that's 14 electrons, two times seven. So we start with 14, but in order to get a two plus charge, we have to lose two. So we actually only have 12 electrons to place in our molecular orbital model. So we start um, with our uh, off bow principle and Hun's rule. Uh, we've got one orbital here, we can have two, we can have two here. Right. We can have uh, P, All right. let's do it like this. Since the, since the question asked for uh, unpaired electrons, we probably should do it like this rather than put them up here. So we have two, oh, sigma, excuse me. Sigma can only have one, okay? Uh, pi's can have two. So we have two, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, okay? Now we have another pi. And Hun's rule says we have to unpair them first before we can go back. These are for degenerate orbits. You have to put electrons in unpaired first, and then you can go back if you have more and start pairing them up. So it's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. So we have two unpaired electrons. Answer C. All right. That one. 19. Oh, this one. Good to start with. CLF. Two plus the hybridization of the central atom in CLF2 plus. Okay, if we're looking at hybridization, we need to find out how many groups are around the central atom. Chlorine is going to be the central atom. Okay. Oh, how many electrons are we dealing with? Right, one, two, three halogens is 21, but we lost one. So we only have 20 electrons to deal with. So there's two, four. That's 16 electrons left over. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Right, so we have four more electrons left. Two, four. So there's our Lewis dot structure. And um, <coughs> around the central atom, which would be chlorine, Two, four, we have one, two, three, four, which is SP3, hybridization. That's C. 21. Which of the following does not contain at least one pi bond? Okay, so we're looking for the one with not any pi bonds. All right. So V, C, D, and E is none of the above. All right, what do we have here? H2C, H2CO, H2CO, CO2. C2H4 and C2H6. All right, that was given out. Try this one. <clears throat> okay, so how many electrons do we have here? We have two plus four is six, plus six is 12. 12 electrons. Here we have four plus two times six is 12, that's 16 electrons. Is that right? Yeah. 
Uh, this one is two times four is eight, plus four is 12. And this one is six plus eight is 14. So now we can draw the Lewis structures. Right. Carbon here, then we're gonna have an oxygen and two hydrogens. Okay, two, four, six. So that means we have six electrons left. And we have two, four, six. Okay, carbon has to have an octet. So what we have to do is move two of these over here. And that makes a pi bond. So that one's got a pi bond. Can't be that one. How about carbon dioxide? We've done carbon dioxide before. Right? We don't have to to uh, uh, stress over this one. All right, there's your pi bonds. So that one doesn't work. How about this one, C2H4? Didn't we just do that one? There's your four hydrogens, two, four, six, eight, ten. So I need two more electrons here, Makes a pi bond, right? Can't be that. How about this one? Carbon, carbon, and hydrogens. And that one's out. So that's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Use them all up. That's got no pi bonds in it. There's an octet here. All the hydrogens have duets. Octets for each carbon, this is the one. That has no pi bonds in it. That's uh, ethane. Twenty-one. Hey. Twenty-four. Complete the Lewis structure for the following molecule. The molecule has so many sigma bonds and so many pi bonds. Okay. Let's see, one, two, three, four carbons in the chain. Two, three, four. Then we've got three hydrogens. Then we have a hydrogen here and another methyl group up here, okay. Then we have an oxygen stuck on there, carbon here and a nitrogen there. Okay, now that's an incomplete structure. So what we have to do is uh, finish the Lewis dot structure. So we have how many carbons? One, two, three, four, five. Five times four, right, plus, Hydrogens, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven hydrogens. And then oxygens is six, and nitrogen is five. Balance electrons, that's what I'm counting on. Okay, so this is 20, that's 27, uh, 33, 38. 38 electrons. All right, total. So we have two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. 22, 24, 26. Uh, it's 12 electrons left. So we start from the outside and move in. And the outside, in this case, none of these hydrogens qualify. They're all full. So we have to work from here. So this is outside and this is outside. We have 12 electrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Okay, we used up all our electrons. Now we gotta make octets. The best way to make an octet for this carbon is to do it on that side only. So we would move these two and those two over. That makes an octet here for this carbon and keeps the octet for nitrogen. So 
okay? And this one, and the reason I'm, I've gone that route is because I know nitrogen um, prefers three bonds. So I put three bonds here for nitrogen. Oxygen prefers two bonds. So we're going to take a, one of those and put it over here. And that makes a double bond here. So we've got an uh, octet there, octet there, two, four, six, eight there, two, four, six, eight there. Everybody's got an octet or a do that. Now to answer the question, how many sigma bonds do we have? You always got to have a sigma bond before you can have a pi. So anywhere there's a bond, it's a sigma. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 sigmas. And then you look for a double and triple bonds. So there's a pi, there's a pi, and there's another pi. So we have three pi's. So 13 sigmas and three pi's is E. Probably the trickiest part about this, um, once you've laid out the basic skeleton, is knowing that this oxygen and that nitrogen are the outsides as you move in, placing your extra electrons. And then where do they go? Um, um, and uh, then making your octets. Only then you can count up the sigmas and the, and the pi's. All right, 26. Consider the skeletal structure shown below. N, C, C, N. Now, we have to assume, if we're going to draw the Lewis dot structure and answer the following questions, we have to assume that there are no other atoms in here. It's just carbon and nitrogen and nothing else. Um, so, we have uh, five valence, five valence, that's 10, and two fours is eight, that's 18 electrons. We have two, four, six used up, 12 electrons. Two, four, six, two, four, six, makes 12. Okay, now we got to form octets. Best way to form octet is just move these two here, here, do the same thing on that side. So now we have a triple bond here, single there, triple there, with lone pairs on the end. Now the question is, how many pi bonds does this molecule have? It's got two here, one, two, three, four. Four pi bonds total. C is the answer. All right, 27. Which of the following molecules contains the shortest carbon-carbon bond? This should be fairly straightforward. If you've ever drawn these before, then you shouldn't have to take a whole lot of time. Uh, oh, and E is B and D. B and D. Okay. A is this one, C2H2. Yeah, C2H4, C2H6, and C2Cl2, four. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Draw the Lewis dot structure. <clears throat> you can go to the trouble of counting up all the electrons. And if you need to, go ahead and do that. But I'm going to use the shorthand, or uh, the rules of thumb. I'm going to draw the skeletons first. Okay, each one of those is a hydrogen. Then this one, there's chlorine there, chlorine there, chlorine there, chlorine there. Um, these carbons need double bonds, uh, needs four bonds each. So we're going to put a double there. This one's going to be a triple. That's a single. I better write these in. 
And this one's going to be a double. Um, and each of these chlorines is going to have lone pairs around it. But that, I don't think that'll matter for to answer our question. Which is shortest carbon-carbon bond. So the shortest carbon bond is the one that has the strongest bond between the two carbons. That would be this one right here. Uh, the more, as you uh, increase the strength of the bond, you decrease the distance between the atoms. Um, now, the way that question is worded, we stop here. That's all you need. If we change the wording around and say, um, which is the longest bond? Well, this one would be the longest right here. Or if we worded it some way that would cause us to, to need to uh, uh, break a tie between B and, and D, then you would look at um, the contribution of these chlorines versus these hydrogens. Chlorines tend to be more electronegative than carbon. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with the answer. It's just something else. Chlorines are elect more electronegative than carbon. They draw electron density away from the carbons, which robs this bond of its electron density to a certain extent and weakens the bond. So this would be a weaker bond, which means the carbons are further apart than this one. So if we're breaking a tie, this one would be a shorter bond than that one. Or if, we, if the question was, put them in order of uh, weakest to strongest. Right? This would be the strongest on that end. This would, be the, um, this would be the weakest on that end. And then these two, you have to figure out which one's which. This would be the stronger one, and this would be the weaker one for, for that reason. All right, let's see, 28. <laughs> All right. We'll pause for a moment. Gabby will be right back. Okay, uh, 28. There. Um, when comparing BE2 and H2, looks like we're into molecular orbitals. And H2. Uh, I guess what we're doing here is which of these are true? These two, these statements. So one, beryllium 
BE2 is more stable because it contains both bonding and anti-bonding valence electrons. Well, let's see, is that true? Beryllium. Let's see, beryllium has uh, sigma 1s, sigma star 1s, and sigma 2s, and sigma star 2s. That's probably as far as we need to go. Beryllium has four. If we're going to include these, then we count all the electrons, four electrons each. So we have eight electrons. So we have two here, two here, two here, and two here. Two, four, six, eight. That tells me that beryllium is not a stable molecule, right? Because <laughs> the bond order here is zero. Um, beryllium is more stable because it contains both bonding and antibonding. No, that doesn't add to its stability. That statement, stability would be more bonding electrons than antibonding electrons. That would contribute to stability. So sta statement one is false. How about statement two? Uh, H2 has a higher bond order than BE2. Well, yeah, the bond order here is zero. And the bond order here, uh, it has, um, excuse me, sigma and 1s and sigma star 1s. And with two electrons, they both go in that orbital. So its bond order is equal to one. So that's true. It does have a higher bond order. Okay. So we found one true statement. H2 is more stable because it only contains Sigma 1s electrons. Uh, yeah. That's true. It's more stable because it only has bonding electrons. It's kind of kissing cousins to Roman numeral two. How about four? All right, so these two are true. H2 is more stable because it's diamagnetic, whereas B2 is paramagnetic. That doesn't have anything to do with it. It's the balance of bonding versus antibonding. Uh, contributing to the bond order. Um, paramagnetism and diamagnetism are true phenomena, but they don't have anything to do with directly with bond stability. It's just the bond order. So two and three is C. C is the answer to number 28. <clears throat> and 29, which of the following species is paramagnetic? And we're looking for paramagnetic, which means what? They're attracted into a magnetic field, which means they have unpaired electrons. Unpaired electrons. All right, so we're looking for unpaired electrons for C2O2F2. C2O2F2 and Li2. C, D. Okay, uh, the best way to do this one, since I didn't have them memorize the, uh, um, the order of uh, molecular orbitals, is to use this chart that will be on the exam. And C2 is uh, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, and pi. 2p. Right. So four each means eight, eight electrons. Two, four, six, eight. This is full, that's full, that's full, that's full. This is diamagnetic. O2. 
And this is um, uh, SP mixing, the dicarbon. Oxygen is not SP mixing. So it's going to have uh, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, sigma 2p, pi 2p, pi star 2p, and sigma star 2p. And that's six each, which is 12. So it's two, four, six, eight, oh, excuse me, two, four, six, and four more is uh, 10. Self confused. Two, four, six, ten. And twelve means we have like that. So this one is paramagnetic. How about F2? Well, you can draw them out like that, but if you don't and you're right on a test, you're trying to maximize your uh, impact for time, just look at the, look at this and look for unpaired electrons. So F2 has all paired electrons, it's diamagnetic. And lithium two, which doesn't have, it's not drawn out here, so we have to look at the order. So uh, lithium has, uh, that's one electron each. Uh, it has uh, two valence electrons. So we would go to the, the valence shell, which is sigma 2s and sigma star 2s. Yeah. And those two electrons would both go in this one. So this one is also paramagnetic. Paramagnetic. So the only one that's... Di um, wait a minute. Is that right? Which of the following species is paramagnetic? Lithium two. D E. None of these. Well, this one's right, but why does why does it leave lithium out? One, two, that's one electron each. Ah, that's a, that's a problem. Because these are both supposed to be paramagnetic. Unless I'm reading this wrong. Three. Let's do the whole thing out. Those are the, those are the two S's. We've got one S's also. Sigma 1s, sigma star 1s. Right. In that case, you would have three electrons each, which would be six electrons, right? Okay, that doesn't help any. This one's supposed to be paramagnetic. So uh, that's a problem. So that one could be B or D. The way it's written. Yeah. Both of them are paramagnetic. Right? And there's no there's no right answer there. So the way to fix that is either change the question or change E to uh, two of the above. <laughs> All right, dead soldier. Um, 30. For how many of the following does the bond order decrease if you add one electron to the neutral molecule? So we got um, B2. C2, P2, C2, P2, and F2. All right, so what we have to do here is um, we need to get the, we 
P2 is the uh, same as nitrogen, only instead of uh, two S's and two P's, it's three S's and three P's. So that would be the tricky one. And then F2 is listed here. All right, so let's, beryllium, beryllium. Oops. S2P, well, SP mixing for beryllium. So it's pi first and then sigma. And we're not going to need that one anyway, because it's got uh, two here, two here, and two here. So they're unpaired. Then carbon uh, uses the same sequence, and it has two here, two here, and four here. Yeah. Uh, okay. And phosphorus is going to be sigma 3s. And since it's under nitrogen, it's sp mixing. So uh, 3s star and pi 3p. And we're also going to need some sigma 3p's. Okay, so uh, valences for phosphorus, same as nitrogen, is 5e, so we have 10. 2, 4, and 4 is 8, and then 10. Yep. And then fluorine. So fluorine is, is non-SP mixing. Uh, it's going to have 2S sigma star 2S uh, sigma 2P pi 2P I star to P and sigma star to P. And then this goes all the way up to, actually, we don't need that last one. This one has uh, two in it. Nope, four. Let's see. 14. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Well, 14. We don't need this. Okay, now we can answer the question. Um, if you add one electron to the neutral molecule, which one or how many does the bond order decrease? In order to, to answer that question, decreasing, you don't need this one, decreasing the bond order would be uh, adding an electron to a uh, antibonding orbital because that would change the mix if we had uh, uh, bonding minus antibonding divided by two equals the bond order then if you increase this one that decreases this term and decreases that value so if you increase the antibonding electrons by adding one then you decrease the bond order. Right, so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for what would decrease the bond order. So if we add an electron, actually I should leave left that one here. No, this one needs some more. So we can add another one to this one. Right. That's a bonding order. So that one increases the bond order. If we add one to this one though, um, carbon, that should be a bonding also. Yeah, sigma 2p. So if we add one to this one, that also increases the bond order. Um, phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus, this is going to be, this is going to be an anti-bonding. So if we add one to this one, that decreases the bond order. And this one, let's see, sigma five, this is also an antibody. 
So we add one to that one because this one's full. This one's full, that one was full. So we add one there, that decreases there. So two of them, if we add an electron to, to the molecule, which would make it a negative ion, uh, decreases the bond order. So that's uh, C. Okay. I think the only one you would have to draw out for that one would be, or to recognize that phosphorus is like nitrogen, since it's in the same family. So the molecular orbitals are going to be in the same order. Unless somebody tells me different. Okay, 32. Order the following from shortest to longest bond. Don't forget the effect of atomic radius and orbital size. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. So C2, B2, H2, and N2. And we want to order them shortest to longest bond. Short bond to longest bond. Okay. Um, so for this one, we need to calculate bond order. That gives us an idea of whether it's double, triple, or some, something in between. So I would take the chart and just say, all right, uh, carbon, carbon. It's got two, four, six bonding and two antibonding. So that's four, two, that's two bond order. Okay. Um, boron. It has one, two, three, four bonding and two antibonding. So that's one. Okay. Hydrogen, we've done that before. Bond order is one. And nitrogen, we've done that one before. Bond order is three. All right, we can do it again. Uh, let's see, two, four, six, eight. Eight minus two divided by two is three. So the longest bond is gonna be the weakest one. And the strongest bond is gonna be the uh, shortest one. This is the strongest bond. So N2 comes first, right? Shortest bond. Uh, then we have, um, next one will be carbon. So let's see, how do I put that? Shortest to longest bond. So carbon has a longer bond than nitrogen. And then we have to say, how do these come in order? Well, if we're a short bond on the left, these have the same bond order, but they're based upon uh, different orbitals. These protons, this nuclei, can get closer to each other because they're based upon 1s uh, molecular orbitals origin. So this one is shorter. This one would be, you know what? You know, it might even be shorter than, I think it's shorter than this one. Right? Because these are based on 2p. I think um, hydrogen goes out here. And then this is left over. Right. Hydrogen would be the shortest, shortest bond. Uh, which, yes. Hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, boron. Okay. These can be compared by bond order because they're all from the two S's and two P's. But this one, when you're talking about, um, Shortest bond, the, the bonding orbitals are closer together. So they let the, the nuclei get closer together. 
That's the trick with this one. Uh, which of the following has a bond order of 1.5? 34. All right, that's another dead one. Thirty-four, yeah, thirty-four. Which following is bond order of one point five? We're looking for a bond order of one point five. All right, so we have O two plus. And into and O2 minus and C2. And then E is none of these. All right, so we know the bond order of this, and we've already calculated it as three. The bond order for oxygen with no charge is two. So O2. Uh, bond order is two. So what happens if you remove an electron from oxygen? We look at our chart. If we move one, remove one from oxygen, that is removed from an n-type bonding orbital. So it, it bumps it up by half right, because we take that electron divided by two. So it gives us another uh, half a bond order. If we add an electron, we're adding that to an anti-bonding orbital, which drops that by another half. And then carbon is uh, two, four, six, minus two is four, is two. So there's your answer right there, 1.5. Now, if you have to, you can go look at the chart and just draw the whole thing out but this is a quicker way. Yeah. C. Thirty-four. Thirty-six. Which of the following statements about the molecule BN is false? Assume SP mixing. B. In. Does that make sense? B in? Yeah. Um, diboron sp mixing and dinitrogen st sp mixing. Right. The breaking line is between nitrogen and oxygen. To the left of of uh, oxygen, nitrogen and over is sp mixing, and oxygen to the right is non sp mixing. So since boron and nitrogen are both from that region, then it makes sense that they're they experience SP mixing. All right, so um, let's draw out the uh, structure, the molecular orbital structure. Two S, two S star, um, sigma two P. No, it's pi two P. Excuse me, SP mixing. I 2P, then sigma 2P, and then uh, I star 2P and sigma star 2P. Yeah. Okay, so how many electrons do we have? This is the valence electrons only. Boron is three, nitrogen is five, so we have eight electrons. Two, four, and four. That's it. That's all we need. So we don't need these. All right, so let's answer the questions. Paramagnetic. Nope, all those electrons are paired. Right, just be like that, 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 that. So it's diamagnetic. So A is false. Its bond order is two. Let's see, four plus two. Four plus two is six, minus two, not about two, so that's two. Bond order is two. 
Oh, it's looking for which one is false. All of the above are true. Okay, so we found a false one. We found our answer, actually. A is the answer. Total number of electrons is 12. Total number of electrons. Right. We were just counting valence electrons here. So we had two more here and two more here is four plus eight is 12. So C is true. And D has two pi bonds. One, two. <laughs> okay, well, we found our answer. Thirty-eight. Which of the following molecules are or ions is not paramagnetic in its ground state? So we're looking for diamagnetic. It's got to be one or the other. Not paramagnetic is diamagnetic, which means all the electrons are paired. So let's see, O2. Let me put them all up here first. O2 plus and B2. B2. And NO. And we assume no mixing, no SP mixing. And E is F2. Okay, so let's look at, we can do these from, uh, from the chart. Uh, O2 is paramagnetic. You can look, it's got unpaired electrons. O2 plus, which means you you remove one of the electrons, it comes, it is derived from an antibonding orbital, but there are two unpaired electrons in that antibonding orbital, so it's still paramagnetic because we only removed one of them. Uh, B2, it's still paramagnetic also because it has uh, a pi 2p orbital with two unpaired electrons, we remove one of them, it's still got one unpaired electron. So all of these are paramagnetic. NO, well, let's do F2 while we're here. If we remove an electron from F2, it comes out of a pi star, but that pi star is full with all paired electrons. Oh, we're not removing any, sorry. This one is diamagnetic. Everything's paired. How about NO with no mixing? All right, so let's use uh, uh, sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, sigma 2p, pi 2p, pi star 2p, and Sigma star, 2p. <clears throat> so nitrogen is going to have, let's see, we're valence only. So it's 5 and 6. It's 11 electrons. 2, 4, 6, and 4, and 1. So that one is paramagnetic also. It's got that unpaired electron. Okay, so E, F2, is the only one that's not paramagnetic, or it's diamagnetic. Thirty nine. In the molecular orbital description of carbon monoxide with mixing. We're looking at carbon monoxide. Uh, four electrons, six electrons, so we have 10 electrons each. And there's sp mixing. We're assume, assuming sp mixing. So it's sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, pi, 
2 P sigma 2 P pi star and sigma star 2 P. In electrons, two, four, and four more is eight, and then two here. So let's see, we're gonna do something else to it. The highest energy electrons occupy anti bonding orbitals. No. A is false. Six molecule, six molecular orbitals contain electrons. One, two, three, four. Nope, that was false. C. Two unpaired electrons. Oh, there are no unpaired electrons. It's false. And D, the bond order is three. Well, let's see. Two, four, six, eight, minus two, divided by two. So that's uh, six divided by two is three, right? D is true. Here's your answer. Forty-one. Let me see which of the following statements about C the carbonate ion is false. Okay. Let's take some explaining. We have an E. All of the above are true. Okay. The orbitals, and we're talking about carbonate. The orbitals on the carbon atom are sp2 hybridized. Well, let's see. We have um, four. Three times six is 18. And two more is 24. So carbon, oxygen, 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 two, four, six equals 18. Three times six is 18, use them all up. Okay, and this is a two minus ion. Okay, so the problem with this one is, which one of these is gonna make that double bond for the carbon? That's where we have to invoke hyper, uh, resonance. So let's just do one of them, because that's all we're gonna to need to answer the question. If we make a double bond here, then we have three groups, which is SP2 hybridized. So is that correct? Yeah, A, sp2 is hybridized, that's true. B, the ion is expected to be paramagnetic. All right, we've discussed paramagnetism and diamagnetism uh, in terms of molecular orbitals. And we haven't, we haven't talked about molecular orbitals for polyatomics. Right? So we have to approach it a different way. Do we have any, uh, based on this model, are all the electrons paired? So there's pair, 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 pair. We don't have any, based on this model, we don't have any unpaired electrons. Yeah, it's kind of squirrely. But if the ion is expected to be diamagnetic, it would have all paired electrons, which under that scenario is true. The CO bonds are different lengths. Are they? Well, based on this model, they would be. That would be shorter than these two. But we know that it resonates where this one could be a double and that one could be a double. So what we discover is that all of these bonds are equivalent in length. So that one's false. All those bonds are the same length. So we found our answer. That's the false one. The ion has a total of 24 electrons. Yeah, so that was true. That's the false one. So this one is, is kind of a difficult one to justify uh, because we only talked about paramagnetism and diamagnetism in terms of molecular orbitals. 
And we didn't do molecular orbitals for polyatomics. All right. How many electrons are involved in pi bonding in benzene? 20, 42. Okay, so benzene, you remember benzene is like this. If we draw it like that, then the electrons involved in pi bonding are uh, pi here, pi here, pi here, which is six electrons or three pair. Uh, which would be six, uh, excuse me, <laughs> D. And those electrons are in fact part of the, uh, the delocalized uh, uh, pi bonding ring, so to speak. Which of the following has the highest bond association to energy? Bond association to energy is which one has takes the most energy to break the bond. Right. So if we start off with B, C, D, and E. Okay. Uh, N2, N2 minus. Into two minus, into plus, and into two plus. Okay. So, uh, to answer this question, we're looking at what's the bond order. And we know the bond order for this one is three, but if we're going to make ions out of it, we probably ought to draw the molecular orbital structure. And that should be mixing. 2s sigma star, 2s pi, 2p, sigma, 2p, pi star, 2p, and sigma star. So that, I know that's right because when you get mixing, you flip these two. So they used to be sigma on this side, you know, flip it. That signal on the right side. Okay, so this is um, five each to 10 electrons, two, four, and four is eight, and then two more here. All right, so the bond order here, we know is gonna be three. Bond order is three. Or eight minus two is six divided by two is three. Okay, when we add an electron, where does it go? The electron has to go into an anti-bonding orbital, which decreases the bond order by a half. So this one's two and a half. If we add two more, if I add one more and make two, now the bond order is decreased to two. Two divided by two is one. So three minus one is two. If we subtract an electron, that means this one's gonna go down to one, which also decreases the bond order by a half. And then this one will go down to zero. Right? That would decrease it a further half, so it's two. So that one, A, has the highest bond association energy. It's still triple bond and the rest of them are smaller double bonds, double and a half. All right, let's see, it's too far. 47. Which of the following does not contain a central atom with D2SP3? Uh, a, wait a minute, 47. A, B, C, D. And this one is uh, xenon pentafluoride. 
with a charge. And IF4 with a charge. And SF6. And SEF5. SEF5 with a charge. All right. <clears throat> We have to draw the Lewis dot structures for each one. This is five times seven is 35 plus eight is 43. 43 minus one is 42, 42 electrons. One, two, three, four, five. Two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. So now we're down to 32. So five times six is 30. That means we have two, two pair or one pair left over. Okay. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. This is SD2, SP3. How about this one? Um, five halogens is 35 plus one is 36. So we put iodine in the middle and we have fluorines around. Two, four, six, eight. 28. So if we put six more around each one of these, that's 24. And that's four electrons left over. Okay, We've got six again, D2, SP3. SF6, uh, sulfur is in the same group as selenium. So it would be just like that selenium hexafluoride we drew before. So it's gonna have uh, S in the middle, and then six fluorines around it, which is also D2SP3. Selenium pentafluoride ion. So selenium is going to be uh, like sulfur six, and five times seven for fluorine is 35 plus one. So we have 36, 42. 42 electrons for this one, but we have selenium, one, two, three, four, five for the other fluorines. Okay, two, four, six, eight, ten, which is 32. And they've put six around each one of these. Five times six is 30. And we have two electrons left over. One, two, three, four, five, six. This one is D2SB3 also. So none of the above. All of them have D2SB3 hybridization. All right, 47. Let's skip a few. Let's see what we got going here. 60, okay. All right, we got to fill out this chart. We've got uh, molecule A, B, and C. And then we've got the per parameters on the left. How many up? Four. One, two, three, four. This one's going to be electronic geometry. This one's going to be hybridization. This one's going to be bond angles. And this one's going to be examples. All right. And it looks like we're given one already. SP3 for this one. Okay. So let me scroll back down so we can get the conditions. Um, molecule A has hybridization SP3. That's given. 
Molecule B has two more effective pairs. So if this one has two more effective pairs, they gotta be here, D2, SP3. Uh, that also means that this one has to be tetrahedral geometry. This one has to be octahedral. And molecule C consists of one sigma bond and two pi bonds. One sigma and two pi. Okay, so what kind of molecule would give you um, just one sigma? Diatomic, that's the only thing you can do. If it's triatomic, you gotta have two sigmas. So it has to be diatomic to give you one sigma. Now, how do you get two pi's out of that? Well, you make a triple bond. <laughs> so that means it has to be linear. No other choice. And that also means that both of them have to be hybridized SP. Okay. So we got that much done. How about bond angles? SP3 is tetrahedral. The bond angles, they would typically be 109.5 degrees. As long as you don't have any lone pairs. If you have lone pairs in there, then that, that puts extra pressure on the bond and shrinks the bond angles. But nominally speaking, 109.5. Examples, methane or carbon tetrachloride would be good. How about octahedral? Octahedral, I always have to draw it out. You have a square in the middle and your central atom there and then there's something out here right so if you draw the lines to each one of these you get an eight-sided object um, so what are the bond angles possible well if all of these positions are occupied by atoms then your bond angles possible are 90 degrees here 90 degrees there or 180 degrees there. So maximum 90 and 180 degrees. So what's the possibility there? Well, we did a couple of them already. Uh, S, uh, SF6 would be a good example. Uh, linear. Linear always has to be 180 degrees. You don't have any other choice. And good example here is like um, um, dinitrogen or acetylene has a triple bond in it. Oh, no, that wouldn't be it. Right, because that's got two extra sigmas. So this would be the best dinitrogen. Oh, carbon monoxide. That works too. Okay, so we filled that one out. Let's see what's next. Oh, got a chart here. Draw a molecular orbital diagram of O2 and N2 using molecular orbital theory. Okay, this one's easy. You just have to replicate that right there. And uh, be sure and label which one's which if this comes up, N2 or O2. Right. And then use that diagram to explain why the removal of one electron from O2 strengthens a bond while the removal of electron from N2 weakens the bond, right? We had uh, examples of N2 up here where we weakened the bond. Um, removal of an electron is actually for uh, nitrogen. There it is on the left. You're removing an electron from a bonding orbital. So that weakens the bond. Whereas for oxygen, when you remove an electron, you're removing it from an antibonding orbital, which strengthens the bond.
And you just have to put that in your own words. That's it. Those are the only ones I had picked out to review. Um, if there are any others in the, uh, I assume that nobody's looked at uh, version two, but if there are any in version one that give you trouble, then we can talk about them now. Otherwise, we're done. For the semester, all, all over now is, uh, is getting that last report in and um, take, taking the last exam, huh? Yeah. yeah. Any questions from the Zoomers? Now, if you, if you go in Brightspace and you don't see a grade, uh, all the exams are taken. So if you don't see a grade for a lab, that means either you didn't turn it in or didn't come through. If it didn't come through Brightspace, then I never saw it and I can't grade it. So check your grades and see if, if you have a, a grade missing, that means there's probably a report missing somewhere. So be sure and, and get those to me so I'll have enough time to grade them. Okay. Otherwise, uh, Merry Christmas, have a good break, <laughs> and we'll uh, uh, maybe we'll see you next semester. <laughs>